Hello, you could call me an artist, and I have been working on a stem-based creature collector, where I not only have a collection of stemma designs, but I've also been coding up a game with them. I'm gonna need more time before talking about the main aspect of my game's combat, but today, let's go over just a piece of it, after we have a discussion about this trope in other titles. Let's talk about status effects. Status effects usually refer to a condition that is applied to a particular character temporarily. The effect calls for a set of rules, but unlike a character's passive or attribute, this effect is not usually native to that character. Now, a creature collector is just like any other role-playing game. It's just that you can regularly recruit opponents, lending more flexibility to your party at the cost of having a more definite story. Thus, the status effects of RPGs translate very well in these games, where a member of your party can get sick or paralyzed, but we're getting ahead of ourselves. By definition, status effects aren't always bad, they're more on a spectrum of buffs and debuffs. Heck, many effects are more ambiguous. For example, Cassette Beast by Bitten Studios prides themselves with various status effects that accompany their type matchups. They categorize their effects into buffs, debuffs, miscellaneous, and transmutations, where the last one is having the Cassette Beast change their type, but the miscellaneous effects also apply a twist to the combat that's not always good or bad, such as changing a move's damage category, or preventing status effects in general. Well, at least in Cassette Beast, that's considered to be miscellaneous, but in Moonstone Island, the same effect is considered to be a buff, mostly because they categorize every effect as a buff or a debuff. So an effect like Rage, which boosts attack while also taking more damage, is still considered to be a buff in this game. But that's the thing with this trope. There seems to be more ways to debuff the character than to buff them. And why might that be? So firstly, there are stat changes, where you could buff a stat to make a character harder, better, faster, etc. But there can easily be debuffs that do the opposite. Okay then. Well, blocking a negative effect can be positive, right? Like the aforementioned effect of granting an immunity to a deleterious status effect. But again, there can easily be the opposite debuff. Mathematically, there could be a negative counterpart to any positive effect. Then why do we usually see more debuffs than buffs? A large category of buffs deal with health, such as having health regeneration over time, or the debuffing inverse would be some form of damage over time. Alright, while healing can come in many themes and elements, they're not as recognizable as the different forms of damage over time. But rather than blaming the aesthetics, I think it's because of how games are designed. Because for games with combat, too much healing and defensive buffs can cause the battle to never end. It's really a numbers game to make these effects balance, but having more health debuffs and offensive buffs that end a battle quicker appears easier to adjust and manage than having too many ways to make an infinite encounter. By now, I think we could start diving into the different thematic categories of debuffs. Starting <laughs> with the most popular status condition, <coughs> poison. I have a previous video going more in depth with how strong of a characterization the poison status effect has to the point where poison can very well be their own element. The slow and painful battle mechanic might not even finish you off alone, but it makes the battle a race against time. Poison is usually straightforward by dealing passive damage every turn, but in Pokemon, Poison comes in two flavors, where one is usually superior over the other as the damage grows per turn. However, it's more rare, and in terms of setting up the toxic hazards, there's more risk to be taken as you need to spend two turns of laying spikes to achieve the badly poisoned condition. And once the character is poisoned, their effect cannot be changed. Hold up, there, there's a little more to discuss here. Pokemon actually has various status conditions, like any other game. But that's because this definition technically counts stat changes, leech seed, infatuation, and a whole bunch of other effects made by various moves. However, when most Pokemon fans refer to status conditions, they're usually talking about a very select group that Pokemon calls non-volatile status conditions, where volatile means prone to change. These non-volatile conditions are more memorable because they stick to the character, even when they're switched out and even between battles. They're still temporary, but it's not time or the number of battles that would necessarily cure the character. But instead, they require rest areas outside of battle or certain moves or items to get rid of the ailment. Pokemon is also one of those games that has both poison and burn damage. So 
how did they distinguish them? Sapphire also hurts. A lot, actually. And being on fire is often used as a damage over time mechanic in games. While many games choose one over the other, they can choose to have both burn and poison damage in the game, or they could also further choose to distinguish them or not. Maybe the amount of damage over time differs, and maybe they have an additional different effect, like a stat lowering debuff. In Pokemon, Temtem, and Coromon, burn also lowers the kind of attack for the character, offering an asymmetric difference between the damage categories in the game. Well, Coromon is a little more symmetric because poison lowers the other damage category. But Moirai's upcoming Aether Master did burn damage a bit differently, where the damage applies when the character moves for the turn, or when they get staggered. Now, there's one last category of debuffs that I want to go over, but I'm not too stoked to talk about this. Well, instead of going into freeze alone, there's a different kind of mechanic here that's used in various themes. So let's name the chapter Immobilization. In a way, this is a debuff version of immunity buffs, where instead of taking no damage, you deal no damage. Heck, maybe you can't do anything. In a real-time game, you can see this in crowd control. And who do people get mad over him? They're just as unpopular in turn-based games. They're important to stop games being determined from the very first few plays, as they can halt the momentum of the winning side. Yet, you could do everything right, but due to luck that's out of your control, these can make your turn fail to execute. Now, as unfair as it is to a player, it should make the opponent feel that much luckier, right? Well, turns out the rage is usually more vocally expressed and lucky wins are diminished and sometimes even embarrassing to be happy about, especially in a PvP setting. Now, Pokemon's remaining non-volatile status conditions all prevent the character from moving in some way. Some are more predictable, but they all have an element of luck. Sleep has a variable wait time unless you use rest yourself, though there is the volatile drowsy condition that gives a turn for the player to retrieve their character before they fall asleep the next turn. Paralysis has a 25% chance to fully paralyze and prevent the character's turn, but otherwise, they debuff the speed. Now, Paralysis was particularly devastating during one of the world's finals, to the point where a lot of changes to the games were made just trying to nerf this darn condition. Oh yeah, and I forgot to mention, as Pokemon has elemental types, some of these status effects cannot be applied to characters of certain elemental types, which is an attribute we can see in other games of the genre. But yeah, now lastly there's Freeze, which is probably the least fair of them all. There's a 10% chance every turn that you can get out of it, but otherwise, you just can't move. There are a few moves that can thaw the player, but you can't expect to have those moves on every member of your team. That's why Pokemon's Freeze can only be applied through rare occurrences from certain attacks, while the others have more dedicated status moves that apply the condition more regularly. Pokemon seemingly moved away from Freeze by having Frostbite in Legends Arceus, which was a mirror of the burden status, but that was understandably not in the mainline games, where the condition was balanced around the previous harsher definition. But yeah, I find conditions that straight up negate your move to be pretty frustrating, especially when you can't anticipate when you would become immobilized. Pokemon's non-volatile status conditions are particularly devastating due to how hard it is to get rid of them. But in many other turn-based RPGs, these kind of conditions are often on some kind of a turn-based timer. Regardless, there are other variations of these effects to make the battle more interesting, like redirection or separate doom counters, and I suppose being knocked out is technically a status condition by definition. But I think I've gone through enough of the big categories here, where I can now explain my current draft of status effects in my own game. Stemma is my stem-based creature collector where each of my creatures are based off of a stem topic. However, why stop there? As I'm making my game based on this theme, I'm trying my best to fit in as many scientific references as I can. I love stat changes and special moves, but I wanted to focus on conditions that stick to the stemma for today. It talked about how I wanted my Toxa type to encapsulate this damage over time playstyle by having Toxa being a pretty defensive type, but the damage is not naturally super effective to any other type. That is unless the opponent is poison, where Toxa skills deal more damage to poison stemma to make the condition a core part of the type's identity. 
poison regularly deals damage over time, and it's been coded in the game already. But what other conditions could I have? Specifically, what kind of hazardous property should I make note of in the game? If only there was a symbolic way to indicate... Uh, anyway, hazard signs. So the safety square was developed by the National Fire Protection Association of the United States. This label was placed on chemicals to quickly tell people what to watch out for when handling them. Higher number, higher danger. The blue square indicates health hazard, red was flammability, how easily a substance catches on fire, and yellow was reactivity, how easily the substance can detonate. White isn't really numbered as they point out any special warnings like oxidizer can burn without air, while a cross W reacts with water dangerously. Now, I think this is a perfect opportunity to set up my status conditions because I wanted Poison to be on a turn-based timer anyways, so now they can last up to 4 turns because these numbers usually go up to 4. Now, flammability could be a similar damage over time deal like how Burn is in other games, but I wanted to make these main conditions balanced in a way. I didn't plan reactivity to have damage over time, and unlike Toxa, my pirate type is already pretty offensively powerful. Having a condition that makes Demma even more vulnerable to pyro damage would make that type a bit too powerful. So I ended up taking some creative liberties with the red square. See, there used to be some warnings called inflammable which was a proper turn to indicate whether something gets set on fire easily, but people used to think that meant not flammable. So nowadays, more labels just use flammable. But that term got me thinking. What if this condition was about inflammation, which is a biological response your body makes in regards to an injury? During inflammation, blood vessels are dilated, so plasma and immune cells can arrive to the point of injury and start fighting and cleaning up any pathogens and or injured cells. And this process also stimulates healing. The dilated blood vessels lead to a raised temperature and tissue swelling, where prolonged inflammation can do more harm to the body's cells than good, and the swelling can inadvertently restrict other important parts of the body, like airways, during certain allergic reactions. I was thinking of having this inflammatory condition to debuff physical attack and speed. However, given the definition of inflammation, maybe it also helps tick the poison counter down if it exists. Because I do want multiple conditions to exist simultaneously, given how they get resolved over time anyways. And this leads to the last one. See, initially with the reactive condition, I thought about having it be like some kind of boon counter, KOing the stemma when counted down. My problem was how this made the number 1 a much scarier number than number 4. Additionally, I wanted these specific conditions to stick to the stemma until they survived enough turns or get knocked out, meaning that the boom counter would doom that stemma with little to no escape. I also considered to change the value to deal like a quarter of the max HP instead, but it still didn't resolve the fact that this made 4 a less scary number than 1, and I didn't want to count up just for this counter alone. So I kinda went the safe route by taking reactivity as effectiveness and making the resisted types deal double damage under this condition. I can easily code in the boom damage back, but I don't know if that's doing too much for a single condition. Mind you, all of this can change. Uh, heck, I'm even leaving the white square open for various conditions later down the development process. Like, while I said I was against conditions that turn you into a sitting duck, I have plans to have some conditions that lock your movement, like sleep, where I have a whole design based off of that concept. While I can easily change the effects of my other three conditions, I'm more or less happy with them right now. Frankly, the hardest part is just deciding how the UI would look like. But if you like this mechanics-based discussion, let me know and follow the channel, because I've been grinding hard on making my game, and there are at least three big steps I need to take before I can organize a demo. I'll make videos of those steps one day, but I'll probably also have to make other smaller videos in the meantime. I want to firstly thank my Patreon supporters for directly supporting the channel and my works. I tried to provide weekly updates about my game to the highest tier, where I show off my basic yet functional combat system that I have so far. However, you can still support me for free by liking and sharing this video. Alright, thank you so much for watching through this video on status effects. Did I leave anything out? Let me know down below. I hope you have a nice one, till next time.